Good afternoon, guests, and welcome to the Weekly with Dr. Tom. This is your way to stay up to date with everything healthcare related across the country. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Marla Indesil, our research manager, and Karen Fung, our research administration coordinator. There will be a Q&A sessions throughout the seminar. Submit your questions as we go by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Elliott will answer as many questions as possible live but all will be answered by case managers in writing. Now, here's Dr. Tom. Good morning, viewers. Uh, I'm in White Rock on a holiday, but I couldn't miss uh, being with you uh, for this special hour of the week. It's our 16th edition of the weekly. Shortly, I'll introduce our special in-house guest experts, Dr. Marla Indusil and Karen Fung. But first, I want to give a science and technology update. It's more of the same from last week. With respect to type one diabetes, I wish to reaffirm the arrival of the artificial pancreas, a technological cure for diabetes, manifest in pump and integrated continuous glucose monitor combinations. And also our plans to begin pump starts in-house with the loop system in the coming weeks, as well as our continued support working with our industry partners with the Medtronic and Tandem closed loop pump systems. With respect to the biologic pharmacologic cure for type 1 diabetes, advances in islet cell transplantation and immunologic interventions, we beta cell preservation, those are the cells that make insulin, continue to be made. We've just recruited our first subject in the PROTECT study, looking at the use of teplizumab in pediatric type 1 diabetes. And we will beginning, be beginning a parallel adult study with ustekinumab in August. On the general front, advocacy remains front and center in our activities. Tristan will speak to the status of our CGM petition. As a member of the board of Variety for Children's Charity, I became aware yesterday of a big donation of funds towards CGM made by a BC Diabetes family. Today, it's about research at BC Diabetes. At BC Diabetes, we do clinical research. That means working with you, our clients and patients, to find ways to optimize care and improve outcomes using new drugs, devices, and strategies. Clinical research has been at the core of our, of our operations since I started out as a specialist in 1992. We have conducted more than 100 studies involving more than 1,500 diabetes clients. Your participation has already had a huge impact on how, BD, on how diabetes is managed not just locally, but globally. Here's a slide showing uh, studies that are either ongoing or have been completed in the last decade. I want to draw your attention to the ones that, that are involved because they have changed already how diabetes is managed worldwide. The Accord study was in type two diabetes. 132 of our clients were amongst 10,000 recruited in North America to determine how low you should go with sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol. And these guidelines are now uh, used by us in our everyday care. The Head Start study was a, a BC diabetes study, uh, which has forever changed the way we provide patient care, that is with case managers. So prior to this, case management was not really taken seriously. At BC diabetes, we know it's actually the best way to improve outcomes and optimize care. And then the last one I've highlighted is the A1C blotter study, which was a study showing that you can put a drop of blood on a piece of blotter paper at home and mail it into the lab to get your A1C every three months. That one hasn't quite, quite come home to roost yet, but I do anticipate it will uh, in the near future. It's time to introduce Dr. Marla Indesil, Director of Research at BC Diabetes. Marla is already known to many of you, given the scale of participation in clinical trials by you all at BC Diabetes. Marla has been running the research side of our operations since 2006. She's an absolute pillar of strength. She's married to Butch and they have three kids, Cesar, Charles and Christy. When she gets some downtime, which is seldom, she likes to listen to jazz and piano. Marla, welcome to the weekly. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon. I would like to begin with a brief overview of why clinical trials is necessary. Next slide. So 
everything starts off with an idea. Picture a doctor or a scientist saying, hey, this might work. He asks a question and tests the hypothesis first on self or animals in a laboratory to see if the new treatment will be safe and will, will work on people. He gets some positive results and then moves on to phase one, which now involves normal, healthy individuals, usually a minimal number of participants. If this is favorable, the process can proceed to phase two. Phase two studies the disease entity for which the drug is hoping to claim efficacy. Here, we still test varying dose of the active drug at this point. This is when a placebo is introduced. Now, what is a placebo? It's a dummy pill. It looks like the new drug, but has no active ingredient. So if it's a pill or an injectable, the active drug looks exactly the same as the placebo. We need to introduce a placebo in order to compare and prove that the new drug works and is safe. This is what we call a randomized control trial. We won't know who gets the active drug and who gets the placebo. Neither will the sponsor know. So double blinded randomized control trial. It's similar to the concept of flipping of a coin. If all goes well, we can move on to phase three, which now involves participants in the thousands. By this time, the optimal dose is close to certain, and we test this drug on participants with the disease and see its safety and efficacy. Now you can see why 80% of new drugs in clinical trials don't go to market. The whole process takes several years, up to 20 years, and is very expensive. Next slide, please. So why do them? Medicine is science-based. All drugs go through clinical trials. As compared to naturopathy, let's say cinnamon. But how much cinnamon? How much cinnamon is needed to bring down your blood sugar? There are no studies on that. Ever wonder where the literature on your package inserts for purchase medications from pharmacies come from? Yep, clinical trials. So we do uh -huh. clinical trials for altruism. We want to contribute to science and bring about a selfless concern for the well-being of others. We want to receive ongoing care and attention from clinical staff. We want to obtain the benefit of newest treatments not available otherwise. We want to be educated and understand diabetes, its causes, effects, transmission, genetic and behavioral implications. Next slide. What are the roles of clinical trial participants? You have to remember, you're a volunteer. There's no coercion, you decide. You can ask family members to help you come up with your decision to participate. You can ask your family doctor to help you as well. You go through an informed consent document which has all the information gained from the earlier phases of the new drug and helps you come up with an informed decision for, for participating. You have to be compliant with the study medication. If you don't take the drug, we won't know if it works. You need to attend all clinical visits. So we do several multiple tests to check the efficacy of the drug. You need to report possible side effects, which could or could not be related to the new drug. You need to relate lifestyle, behavioral, and emotional challenges, which may seem to affect your blood sugar in your opinion and have us decide that and whatever the food choices are. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. So this last slide shows our ongoing recruiting clinical trials. You were most likely approached if you do qualify and if you are eligible. So the first column shows the TAC2 chelation trial for type one diabetes mellitus as well as type two diabetes mellitus. If you recall, Dr. Tony Lamas spoke on a web webinar previously for this trial. Patients with, uh, with have a history of uh, an MI have a 50-50 chance of getting active drug versus placebo. The next column shows the arise heart failure. If you recall, Tom, uh, Dr. Elliott also spoke about this in the webinar a few weeks ago. So this is type two diabetes mellitus patients in early heart failure you actually don't have any symptoms, so it's a guessing game. You're between the age of 40 to 80 years of age, and then you come up with a, 
with the possibility of having an echocardiogram for free to figure out whether or not your heart is starting to have, going into heart failure or a, call, a CPET, which is called a cardiopulmonary exercise test. We test and see all of the uh, results of this to see um, if you are possibly going into heart failure and the drug may do you some wonders. The chances of getting active drug is 66%, placebo 33%, A1C less than 8.5. The next two columns are actually GLP-1 agonists. Um, one of them is the terceptide trial, which involves participants that already have uh, the complication of diabetes heart uh, complications, so an MI or an existing event. And the cotadotide is uh, the opportunity to have a GLP with participants that are type 2 diabetes that have um, ongoing chronic diabetic kidney disease. Terzepatide is compared with Trulicity, which is in the market. So this is, a, this is an opportunity to get 100% uh, free drug for five years. Um, A1C is uh, 7 to 10.5 to qualify. Cotadotide, A1C is 6.5 to 12.5, with a 75% chance of getting active drug. And then the very last column, I have teplizumab. So this is a monoclonal antibody trial for type 1 diabetes in kids, newly diagnosed within the ages of 8 to 17 years of age. This is a trial that's looking at the possible cure for type 1 diabetes in children. And the concept is it hopes to prolong the honeymoon period of your endogenous insulin or your beta cells. And that's it for me. Back to you, Luke. Actually, I think it's back to back to Tom. Um, back to Tom. Okay. Rather than um, rather than going to questions for Marla, we're going to proceed straight to, uh, to have Karen speak. Um, Karen Quinn Fun has been at BC Diabetes since 2014. Her job title is Research Administration Coordinator, but it just doesn't do her tasks justice or speak to just how how greatly she contributes to life at BC Diabetes. Not only does she run our Human Research Protection Program, which she will speak to, but she's also a tech expert and troubleshooter extraordinary. I've never seen anybody who's as good with a spreadsheet as is Karen. Her background uh, is in city planning. She has a master's degree focusing on community planning, especially public transit. And now she works uh, with our research staff, of course, to do uh, human research protection. Uh, in her spare time, Karen loves to bike, and she says she likes going to boring city meetings. So if you want to know how things change at the level of the city with respect to, to community planning, Karen is one of these uh, silent, one of these contributors who we really uh, see very little of. Karen, welcome to the weekly. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you to everyone attending um, here to talk today about our Human Research Protection Program which we established in 2016. And as it says on the tin, it is uh, intended to protect the people who are involved in our research. And it does that in a couple of ways. Mostly it focuses on the rights and the welfare of people in research. And uh, it does that by looking at the international and national practices on how to do research ethically. And uh, I'm gonna zoom in today in uh, my presentation here really briefly on three ways it does that. Um, the first way is that we make sure that all research that we do here at BC Diabetes undergoes a strictly regulated process called ethics review. Second way it does that is that we make all of our activities focused on this idea of ongoing informed consent, which I'll dive into. And the third thing is that we are constantly gathering feedback from everyone in the process, whether that's staff, participants, or anybody else who's involved. And we really take the time to reflect on how we could be doing it better for um, uh, to make sure that uh, patients are at the center and that their needs are being met through re the research process. Uh, we also work with an organization called the Association for the Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs. And that's really the fact that uh, all around the world, clinical trials are being conducted and everybody is learning how to make uh, research patients uh, feel like they're being more supported and that their needs are coming first, especially as research is also changing. And the association helps us to make sure that we're uh, doing what everybody else is learning and learning from each other. I'll uh, 
get on to the next slide? Yeah, we'll talk about uh, ongoing informed consent. Marla had mentioned the informed consent form. Uh, that's basically um, a document that breaks down as much information as we have about um, the new, uh, what intervention or drug, whatever it is we're testing. Um, and informed means that, you know, we're trying to give as much information about what we think is going to happen throughout the course of the trial, what we would do in the event of some of the things that we might be able to predict. Um, you know, and there's a lot there. So um, it's really important um, that we give people time to consult with their family doctors, seek second opinions, work with their family members or their workplaces to figure out if there are any changes that might be involved because some of these trials might go on for quite a long time. Uh, but we also, um, you know, try and give a lot of time for people to make that decision in an informed fashion. And then ongoing just means that, um, you know, because these trials keep going, we know things might change with uh, things in your, your own life, things we might learn things, we might learn things from other people who are doing the study in um, other sites. And um, it's a commitment to say, once you sign the form, we're going to keep keeping you informed. And consent means that at any time, if anything changes, that you learn something new, you know, something in your life happens, then you're able to withdraw your consent and withdraw from the study. So uh, some of the things that you might uh, want to know if you're um, interested in participating in research are things like, you know, what's involved? You know, how much, how much am I going to have to do in order to help out? Um, what are we going to be learning about um, the patients who are participating in the study? Um, how are we going to be protecting um, that information since some of it's going to be um, really personal or confidential? And, um, you know, if I already have a treatment plan and I'm, you know, doing something that's new, how is that going to affect that or will anything about my uh, care change? I'll go on to the next slide. We'll talk about ethics review, and uh, I have a picture there from the Hunger Games um, where uh, Katniss is volunteering as tribute um, because uh, one of the big things that ethics review focuses on is this idea of voluntariness. You know, we want to make sure that the people who are working and helping us with research are doing so out of their own free will and that they're going in with their eyes open. And um, in particular, there are two things, two concepts uh, related to this, undue influence and coercion. That's basically this idea that, you know, we want to make sure that people don't, um, people are thinking about the power relationships that it might be involved. So for example, that could be a professor and their student or a uh, employer and their employee, or of course their doctor and their patient, you know, that um, it's not real volunteering if anybody feels like anything's going to bad is going to happen if they don't, you know, pitch in. So um, we are definitely um, very careful about that. Coercion also is this idea again that, um, it, you know, if you think something bad is going to happen if you don't if you don't participate, then that's not real volunteering. And ethics review um, really makes sure um, you know they're going through everything with a fine tooth comb. Um, that also extends to um, the information that we give patients at the start of a study, um, if we're what, what we're going to tell them, and it also um, pertains to trade offs. You know, thinking about. Um, a study, you're going to get some benefits, but we're also going to ask you to do something. And what what is that balance like? You know, um, if people are coming in from really far away, or if they're going to have to take lots of time off work, then we might look at compensation. You know, trying to um, uh, make sure that um, your participation isn't having um, a really problematic impact on the rest of your life. Um, we're all, we also, uh, or ethics review rather, um, looks very closely at conflicts of interest. So this idea that any of the staff that might be involved in the study might have roles or obligations that might make, whether it actually happens or whether it looks like it might happen, this appearance or potential for um, your opinion or, or professional judgment being affected in some way that would not um, be in favor of, um, of the patient's uh, rights and welfare. And what we do is that if there's anything that looks like it might be in that realm, we make a plan to manage the conflict of interest. And the way that we do that is we either tell people that exists or we seek independent external expert opinions to essentially give second opinions um, to make sure that everything is on the up and up at all times during the study. If you would like to learn more about um, how we protect patients in research, I invite you to check out our website where we talk more about what we do or give us feedback. Back to you, Tom. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Karen. So great hearing from two of the smartest women around, brilliant minds who everyone at BC Diabetes has the pleasure of working with on a daily basis. We're going to jump to some Q&A now. And just a reminder that guests can submit their questions live by going to the Q&A tab at the bottom of their screens. We have first one from Nick. We have a couple questions from Nick. I think he's interested 
in the process of fast tracking and wondering if it's something we ever do. Marla, could you answer that for us, please? Okay, thanks for the question, Nick. You do know there's a, there are several governing bodies that oversee clinical trials. So you have Health Canada, you have FDA, if it involves North America, and then you have the Ethics Committee. And then you also have a data safety monitoring board. So it's very hard to fast track because there's so many people looking in to make sure that you are safe. So everybody wants to fast track and most particularly the drug companies, they wanna make some profit if it works. So think of it in a family, everybody's pushing you but somebody's holding you back. Very difficult. And if, if I could add, uh, you know, during COVID, there's huge pressure on, on regulatory bodies to give approval to drugs or therapies that have not gone through the proper, um, you know, animal studies, phase one, phase two studies. So there's a lot of pressure on government um, to do that. And uh, there's no simple solution. Karen, you, you probably have something to say on that too. Yeah, um, I think uh, when we have really well-defined processes for um, going over the data, you know, when we know where we're planning very carefully for what we expect to find in terms of things being unsafe or safe, then, you know, we can really turn things on a dime. Um, for example, um, I'm aware of um, some companies in Vancouver that are involved in some of the COVID-19 candidate vaccine trials. You know, they're already on to phase two and three, which, you know, s s blows my mind. But um, because their processes for manufacturing were so regimented, um, as soon as, you know, something needed to be done, they were able to jump into the act. to move on to the next one. Okay, thank you all. We're gonna to go to the next question from Richard here. It's an interesting one. Dr. Elliot, you're the owner of BC Diabetes, but also the principal investigator. How do you manage this conflict of interest? Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm glad this question came earlier rather than later. It, it is all important. Um, I, number one, I declare it. So if, if a patient's doing a study and we're inviting them to do it, I, if, if it's a study, it profits. Diabetes will benefit. Now there are altruistic reasons for that. That's keeping all my staff employed, but at the end of the day, there, there may be profit for me. So um, you have to know that, but more importantly, um, I give my word that I think this study is in your best interests. And then I invite you to go and ask, talk to other people you trust, for instance, your family physician or friends, or friends and family members before you sign the, the informed consent. So we, we take it very seriously. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. The next question is from Marla and it's from Susanna. Marla. How are we protected in clinical trials? Could you get into that a bit? Okay, so you did see that I, there are different phases for clinical trials. Number one, um, when you sign a consent, it's going to tell you all the findings that were previously discovered during the earlier phases of the trial for that drug. So you'll be informed just knowing what the side effects were in animals, what the side effects were in normal, healthy individuals, what the side effects were on the different doses in phase two, and uh, what stage you are when you're getting into that trial. That's one way. You have to read that very important document very carefully. Secondly, the other way that you are protected is everybody is anonymous. So you come up with a, you, you, you're given a number that will just identify um, your health condition. So your blood chemistry, all your laboratory work, your medical history,
but it doesn't identify you as you. They won't know your name. They won't know, they'll probably know the year of your birth, but they'll have your medical history. And then because you come in quite frequently during the course of the trial, we have a baseline, which is what we call the screening visit. This is where you're at before you're even started on the drug. So that's your condition at this point. And your protection is if you veer away and it doesn't look good during the course of the trial with another blood test, if you get in and it's not safe, we stop you. So for now, I think that's the most important that you have to consider. Thanks again, Suzanne. Thanks, Marla. The next question is from Magnus and it's to Karen. What kinds of compensation or support do participants receive for taking part in a trial? Hi, Magnus. That is an excellent question. It, I would say it really varies depending on what's involved in the trial. Uh, some of our trials can be very simple. You know, you walk in one day and you're kind of you know, maybe we see you once more in six months or something. And some trials, you know, we, we get people coming in like once a week for, you know, several, um, several weeks or maybe several months or we, and some, one, some of them vary to, you know, extend to several years, as I mentioned earlier. So I would say that the level of uh, compensation can be think for things like, you know, your travel time to come to our clinic, um, your travel time if you need to have any uh, diagnose, diagnostic uh, procedures done at another office. Um, it, you know, if you have to be at our office for a very long time, then you might be compensated for your time, although that, this could be your, your time at a living wage rate, maybe not, um, you know, your billable hour time if you're a, a lawyer or an engineer. Um, you know, and we're basically really trying to make find a happy balance. And again, the ethics review committee um, puts a lot of uh, attention into what how people are being compensated. Um, and of course, uh, as uh, both Marla and Dr. Elliot have mentioned, you know, if if you see it as a benefit, you know, you do be uh, you do get access to um, certain treatments, and uh, most people do consider that a, a, a benefit. Um, and um, you know, uh, and it's. Uh, because there's a, a bit of um, new, newness involved in them, um, you're, you're compensated maybe indirectly through the support of our, our staff members. Okay, up next we have Mary. Justin, can I just, can I just add something? Please. So typically patients will be paid $20, $20 for a study, and if it's a more complicated one, it'll be $50 to cover the costs of, of parking, of gas, of incidental. So the, you know, to pay any more than that, to pay hundreds of dollars for that would be coercion and that would be like bribery. So the ethics committees don't allow us to do that, nor could we afford to do that. So am I right to assume that we're basically just trying to cover expenses? Yes, that is, that's what ethics committees, that's how they focus. If it's more than a reasonable expense, they will not allow it. Fantastic. We have Mary now. Dr. Elliot, as far as I know, BC Diabetes is the only center doing diabetes research in BC. Why aren't there more places doing clinical trials? Thank you, Mary. Um, there are other places actually. Um, Dr. David Thompson, my colleague up at VGH is doing an important study in, in islet cell transplantation in type one diabetes. And we may talk about that further. There are some uh, other physicians in Victoria and in um, uh, and in New Westminster doing some clinical trials. There used to be way more, and I think really what's happened is that um, two, two factors. Number one, there's a huge uh, infrastructure, a large infrastructure required to do clinical trials. You need to have a human research protection program, for instance. So we're, we're blessed to have Karen with expertise in that. Most people don't have a, you know, a doctor in this field. Marla's a, 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 a few and far between. So the, the organizational component is big. And then finally, the margins are, are tight. So as a business, um, there's a lot of competition from countries with much lower costs like China and Brazil, um, to name two. So it's, 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 it's logistically difficult and it's a tough business. Thanks, Dr. Elliot. We're going to cut out to our weekly segment, Arthur's Corner now. 
We have Dr. Weisinger, who's our staff scientist, and he will be discussing sugary drinks. Arthur, please. Thank you, Tristan. Today, I'd like to talk just a moment about sugary drinks and cardiovascular disease. I try to be positive in these little talks, but I'm sorry, this is just a little bit frightening. First slide, please. The California teacher study is a very large experiment that's been running since 1995. As a part of that study, the relationship between sugary drink consumption and cardiovascular disease, that is heart attack, the need for bypass surgery or strokes, was assessed for over 106,000 people, which is a tremendous sample. Slide please. Daily consumption of sweetened sodas, waters, and teas was associated with a 23% higher risk of cardiovascular disease. The kind of beverage consumed also had an effect. Drinking one or more sugar added fruit drinks daily was associated with a 42% greater likelihood of having cardiovascular disease. Slide please. The researchers hypothesized that sugar may increase the risk of these diseases in several ways. Importantly, all of these conditions cause narrowing of the arteries, which is an underlying mechanism in most cardiovascular diseases. Thanks, Luke. The American Heart Association recommends that added sugar be limited to 100 calories a day for women or about 150 calories a day for men. Sugar sweetened beverages are the single biggest source of added sugar in the diets in North America. So for now, we should all watch those sugary drinks and I'll see you here again next week. Thanks, Arthur. We're gonna get back to Q&A here. We have one from Marnie for Marla. I've been part of the research with another doctor for another drug, but it did not go well. If I have problems, where do I go? Do patients have recourse? <laughs> Very good question. Well, you, uh, clinical research participants are always are protected. So your first recourse would be, um, you could go to me <laughs> and I'll try to resolve what the problem is. If there was a problem with whoever it is you were dealing with, with the research, or you could always go up to Dr. Elliot to ask him if there's a concern. But if you go back to the co informed consent, there is a human research ethics board. So for any questions you have about the research on the way it's being conducted, you can go to that research board and all that information will be in the consent. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Marla. Um, we have one from Shade next. Getting a bit of feedback. We have one from Shade next and it's for Dr. Elliot. Is the study with A1C where you can perform it at home with a blood test and send it to the lab ongoing now? If not, when will it start? Thank you, Shade. No, the study was, we actually finalized it a couple of years ago. So the, the reason that this is not available to you as a person living with diabetes is that it has not been approved by the Medical Services Commission of the, the Ministry of Health as a billable item. So for instance, Life Labs, which, which probably does your A1C now, they could do it, but they wouldn't get paid for it. So they need to apply for approval. Um, I, I have to admit, I, I have a little bit of accountability, I feel like, because I'm, uh, it's, it's something that we need to do and work with Life Labs to, to submit this requisition to, to the Medical Services Commission. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. The next question is for Karen. Are the same high standards of human research protection at BC Diabetes adhered to in other jurisdictions? Is a study conducted in Western Europe and North America better than one done elsewhere? Can we believe the results of COVID-19 studies from China or Brazil? Wow, that is a thinker. Um, I would say um, that there's, you know, like with most things in 
all life, the doubles and the details. Um, and it really comes down to, you know, who is on the ethics review boards of the, um, who's, who, are, who are approving the research or reviewing the way that results are being published um, for any research that's done anywhere, you know, anywhere around the world. Um, I know that the uh, AHARP, the uh, Association of Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, uh, which I mentioned earlier, um, they are accrediting organizations worldwide all the time. Um, so it really comes down to, you know, do we, do they have measures to check whether they're doing what they say they're doing on a regular basis? Um, you know, and from that point forward, you can start to um, really assess whether or not it's trustworthy. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, the question is who, who is, you know, are there people to comb through those details and um, is that work being done? And then um, I would take it from there to uh, say whether or not um, we can trust the research. And this is also a reason why um, things are done, um, you know, the, the, the longer pharma process, for example, um, does seek to replicate results in um, multiple sites around the world. So um, you could see that that would be some, the value of that to, to make, um, to give us more, more trust in the process for um, drugs that are released more widely. Okay, we're gonna go to Stan next. This one is to both Karen and Marla. So Marla, maybe you could start. I have seen monitors for studies at BC Diabetes on occasion. What are they doing? Oh, monitors are required. They're being, they're, they're being paid by the big sponsors and they check the work that's being done at BC Diabetes for the uh, protocol that uh, the sponsor's working on. So what they do is they audit in a way What's not written and documented didn't happen technically. That's what it is. So they, um, they're uh, noticing whether what we write down and all the results of all the chemistries, all the blood tests, and all the physical exams and everything that we do, if it's documented, it's exactly as it states when we enter it onto a third party, um, what they call, uh, um, electronic data capture. So there's a third party company that we work with and we enter all the data into that so that they have access to any point in time. So, but they need somebody to come into the site and see that what we're reporting is actually what's happened. So, so the bottom line, they're, they're checking if the results are believable. Is that right? Yep, yep, yep exactly. And we're doing it as exactly as the protocol requires us to do so. And if they do find something that we're not doing right, they would call our attention to it. So we've Very been cool. audited by Health Canada and we've been audited by FDA in the past and we've passed through that and we've been compliant to all. So those are because, you know, they do it as a process and, and that does happen. Thanks, Marla. Karen, is there anything you want to add to that or should I jump to the next question? All I would really add is that, um, as I was saying in the previous question, auditing is just a huge part of um, making sure that we can continue to trust um, the science coming out of the trial. So um, we do internal audits here. We do audits with a sponsor because sponsors have their own interests in making sure that the trial is trustworthy and reliable. Um, and we also have sort of a bit of a, a separation with the sponsors as well, because after all, they have their interests in, um, in, in the results of the trial. So for example, we um, maintain confidentiality and we try, try to uh, make sure that um, staff, are, that, that monitors are, um, are committed to maintaining the anonymity of the patients who are involved so that there's no way that there would be any pressure put on them um, related to um, the outcomes. Um, and then again, um, there are other levels, um, such as the regulators, who are also empowered to do audits. And um, we're also required to report a lot of things to, uh, um, to our ethics review board if things do happen. So um, there are sort of almost like an onion, many layers of oversight, um, making sure uh, with a, uh, a fine-tooth comb that um, everything's on the up and up at all stages. Okay, we have Alexa here. She says, Dr. Elliot, I don't think it's anything personal or against BC diabetes, but my family doctor is not keen 
on me taking part in research? Do I need her okay for me to participate in diabetes research? Thanks, Alexa. Well, no, you don't. You, you know, one of the beautiful things about our system is that we have freedom of choice um, at, at most levels. So um, I obviously I want you to maintain a good relationship with your family doctor. Occasionally um, there have been conflicts where I've had to speak to the family doctor and explain why we're doing the study and they've, they've told me, Dr. Elliot, thanks, but no thanks. And then you, then I, I guess you have to, if your doctor is willing to still be your doctor, despite you doing the study, then I think that's an ideal situation. If, if the doctor isn't, then you'll have to decide whether you find another family physician. But I do, I do give you my word of honor that, that what we offer here at BC Diabetes, uh, if there's a clinical trial on offer, it is in your, we think it's in your best interests and will, uh, but we won't apply undue influence or coerce you. Thanks, Dr. Elliot. Now, Luke, I'd like at this point to go to the petition. So we did tell you about this last week. At BC Diabetes, we firmly believe that access to healthcare should not depend on a patient's ability to pay. So as you can see here, we are almost at 10,000 signatures. And if you, hadn't, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to support our petition. You can do so at change.org slash BC Diabetes. And again, change.org at BC Diabetes. All our staff are behind it. We've reached out to the community and it's going really well. We're very optimistic about it. It's for CGM coverage by Pharmacare for type one diabetics in BC. We're gonna jump back to the questions now. The next one is for Marla. Marla, could you tell us exactly about exactly what efficacy means and how it relates to research? So in a protocol, uh, the efficacy is defined as an endpoint. So they would have uh, what they hope to achieve, what they're hoping to achieve. So I did mention that there's a question that they post um, and they want to get that answered. So the eff efficacy would be um, as stated on an endpoint. So it varies, like um, will your A1C come down? How much are they expecting it to come down? Will your weight come down? Will your cholesterol, your triglycerides come down? With a newly diagnosed teplizumab trial, will your beta cells in your pancreas continue to be preserved and produce more insulin so that you don't have to take uh, exogenous insulin? Or, you know, those are, how effective is it? Are your numbers uh, showing that you have preserved your, your cells? So it depends, it depends on the protocol that you're looking at and how you want to value efficacy. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Marla. We have Zachary here. And he asks, Dr. Elliot, I've had a heart attack. Do I qualify for research or is it too risky? Thank you, Zachary. Well, if you have diabetes and you've had a heart attack, as long as your kidneys are in good shape and you don't smoke cigarettes and you're over the age of 50, you can do our TAC2 study. Is there risk involved? Well, um, the, the ethics, the, the TAC2 study um, has been through a rigorous ethical review practice. So the, the members of the ethics committee consider that there is either little or no risk or that the benefits far outweigh the risks. So with, with respect to uh, the TAC2 study, there really are no risks inherent, um, providing the, the infusion of the chelation is done slowly and, and according to protocol. So uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's the answer. Thank you. Next question is for Marla. Marla, how long do studies go for? What's the shortest and what's the longest? That's a very good question. <laughs> Depends on what they want to prove, right? So there are some trials that are really very quick. Um, they could go for 
six months. They could go for a year. There's some trials which look at uh, outcomes. So you have existing events, whether it be with your heart, your kidneys, um, and they wanna see if for another period, they have statistics that are out there. Um, if you don't go on this drug and you have an MI, let's just say back to, if you have an MI and you don't have chelation done, um, what are your chances of having another MI? So in the next couple of four, four or five years. Um, and they have statistics that are out there that prove that you would get another MI probably um, in, what is it, Tom? Several years. Yes. But if you do have a chelation done, the chances of having another MI drops in diabetic patients by 40%, which is a big number. So that's why that, that study may go for they, they've shown that it, they, you have to have 40 sessions, so that goes for a whole year. Now, there are other trials which go for three to five years. The longest trial I've been involved with, with Tom, went for, well, uh, well, it started before I got in, so it went for about 15 years. That was the ACCORD trial. And um, it was an mm -hmm. academic trial. It wanted to prove if lower A1C was better lower blood pressure was better and lower cholesterol values would be better for diabetes patients. And this is how uh, most, um, Accord is now, it's a, it's, a, it's a staple. It's the way diabetes is being run. We always go back to it as reference because we found out, um, you know, you don't have to have a A1C if you've been a diabetic for a long period of time. You don't have to have an A1C if you're you're elderly, you're over 60, you don't have to have it go down to less than 6% because your chances of, of low sh blood sugar outweighs the benefits. So you're, they've, they've set the range to, you know, between 8, 7.5 to 8. So those findings were because the ACCORD trial went for that long period of time, they found out there was no efficacy. So, um, so that, that really depends on what you're trying to prove. Thanks, Marla. Uh, we have a question from Donald here. I'm going to paraphrase it a bit. So Dr. Elliot, do you ever collaborate with clinics in other locations? I think Donald is interested in the chelation trial, but he's worried about travel frequency. Do you ever collaborate with other clinics? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Don. We, we try to. Um, once again, the same kind of infrastructure, logistical problems, they tend to be insuperable. Um, if we were able to find um, sufficient patients in the valley to do the chelation study, I think we could do it. So um, we, we're actually doing um, a Facebook campaign right now, reaching out to people with um, who might be eligible for, for the chelation study. And if we find sufficient, we, we could approach a, um, somebody in the valley to do the chelation. It would be a lot of work, but we, we would like to do it. We, we obviously want things to be as, uh, as, as, le the, as least inconvenient for you as possible. Thanks, Dr. Elliot. We have one from Caroline here. Does Health Canada accept trials from Europe for registration of a new ingredient or a new claim on an existing one? Or do they require some North American trials in most, if not all cases? Does your clinic have international collaborators or do you mostly work with US companies? <laughs> well, these are the best questions we've ever had. Um, if, if, you know, if I were the chair of, of Health Canada or the FDA, I would, I would probably answer, well, we're going to do an independent review of the data. And if, if it meets our standards, then they will accept it. Um, it it's good that, the, that, there are, you know, that the European uh, Commission has its own uh, board, just, just as does the US and every other major, um, or the wealthy countries. It, um, it, provi it provides competition, it's a, it's a fail safe, it's a double and triple check. Um, I would say in general, they do accept 
if, if the quality is considered high enough, then, then studies done in the European uh, community would, would be accepted uh, in, in Canada and the United States, though the review process will be slow. So for instance, Canada tends to get drugs and, and um, devices a year or two after the US, and the US is, is notably slow off the mark. You know, they've been burnt. All it takes is for, is for a drug to get to market that hurts people. And, and the best example of that is thalidomide. Thalidomide was a, a drug given to women who had um, morning sickness, you know, nausea during pregnancy, and it caused terrible deformities with, with their arms. So the, these, these regulatory bodies are very cautious and conservative, and rightly so. Okay. Couple last questions here. To Marla, is the research for diabetes always with medications? Is it always injections like insulin? Very good question. Um, no, <laughs> we actually have uh, physician initiated, investigator initiated trials, one of which is mindfulness. So it's an app. So it tests to see how an app will calculate how calm you are, <laughs> how you are able to meditate and how your emotions are a factor in your blood sugars. How we actually had one trial when we tried to, um, which is the BCD app as well, which tried to incorporate, it was an app as well. It's considered, a, it was considered a, a medical device, uh, which was a little difficult to get approval for, but it actually calculates um, how much lifestyle and physical activity you do and how that can improve your, your glycemic control. It's same way as the mindfulness app. So yes, not all clinical trials happening at BC Diabetes involves a drug or an injectable. Thank you, Marla. One last question from Riley for Dr. Elliot. Dr. Elliot, when did you realize that you liked doing research? <laughs> Thanks, Riley. Well, soon after I finished my specialist training, I, I went, well, I, I, in my endocrine specialist diabetes training in, included two years of research in London, and I worked with wonderful people there, mostly in, in bench research, but also with patients, clinical research. When I got back to Canada, the, the, the UBC division head was Dr. Tony Morrison, and Tony was involved in the DCCT study, which was the study in type 1 diabetes that first showed that if you improve your sugar control, you reduce complications. So this was just so exciting. Um, and I kind of ran on his coattails, uh, and gradually more and more studies came my way. And of course now, BC diabetes is a we, it came our way. So uh, it all started out um, with a love of science and then the demonstration that we could actually participate in the science and, and make a difference and change things. Excellent. Okay, we're gonna go to Tom for his outro now. Dr. Elliot, please. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you so much, Karen and Marla, for taking time to appear on the weekly as our guest experts on research amidst your very busy job description. Next week, we have an exciting and uplifting special installment of the weekly with Meg Soper, nurse, humorist, and motivational speaker to inspire us to be the best we can be, not just during COVID, but at all times. She will also be telling an interesting story of serendipity about the recent happenings within BC Diabetes that you surely will not want to miss. For the week after, the topic and guests are to be announced. Once again, we apologize if we weren't able to get to your questions, but they will be answered by email. Thank you all, and bless you all, and we wish you a lovely week. Okay, at this point, we'd like to say a special thank you to our partners, to Dr. Indusil and Karen, and you, our beloved audience. Have a lovely end of your week, enjoy the weekend, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye for now.